Empire. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Standard Groom Only Podcast. Yes, I'm your host, Ben Standard. I cover the Washington Commanders for The Athletic. It is Sunday. I guess it's still late morning. The Commanders just wrapped up practice. Uh, they were off yesterday. They'll be off tomorrow, but they practiced today. We spoke with Jaden Daniels after practice, so we'll get into all of that good stuff. Uh, my guy, Bram Weinstein, is here with me. I can't even plug you. How am I plugging you right now in terms of your your shows? Oh, good lord. Do we, uh, uh, so, all right. Uh, this could take a while. <laughs> well, should we, should, we, should, we, should we wait for that until later? I was, I'll just tell you real quick. I'll try to do the summation of it. Let's yeah. see. My radio show is now a podcast on Empire Media, but it still airs exclusively on ESPN 630 from 11 to 12, and then it becomes a podcast immediately at 12 o'clock. And, um, you know, fortunately, I'm still the play-by-play voice of the Washington Commanders. That, uh, uh, absolutely. And, and, and a good one at that who's got good thoughts. We'll discuss Jaden and practice and all that good stuff in a couple of minutes. Um, I have mentioned over the past few episodes that there's going to be an announcement coming up about this podcast. I think it's time to make it. Yeah. Um, so here's the deal for the quick backstory. The Athletic... They're focused on national podcasts, and the local ones, they're kind of, don't really care. I'm not saying anything out of school. That's just the reality of the situation. And I wanted to, as you guys have heard me say before, I've been sort of a one-man show this whole time, and I can do it, but it's more fun to work with a group and a team, and I've got the opportunity to do that. So, Bram has kindly brought me into the fold. I'm going to be part of the Empire Media Empire. Uh with Bram and of course John Kime is there as well so here's the deal first of all I don't know why you're doing this but thank you for doing this no I mean we're happy to have you we've been talking about this for a long time because you know I've been in the audio and podcast space forever and um you know I've been talking to you about your podcast I think obviously you are as plugged in as anybody in this area not only with this team but nationally too I think it's a differentiator and I think you have a really strong voice and, you know, I've always been looking for, in building this company, you know, strong programming. And um, I'm really glad that we've had the opportunity to do this. And it's the athletics loss, you know, in my opinion, that they're doing it that way. But, you know, it's not disparagement to them. It's, yeah. it's they're committing resources in different ways. This is part of our business. And, um, you know, I think you're going to be an incredible fit for what we're doing. And I'm glad that you're here with us. And I do want to point out, there was one quirky part of this, like, because the athletic wasn't and this is two in the weeds but wasn't releasing the feed and not really giving you the name we're changing the name of the show to do you want to announce it <laughs> I, I guess i yeah. can but yeah, yeah so that's part of the deal this is why we we need uh everybody here to, to be on board with this so we're gonna have to start the feed over bram has already started the feed if you go to itunes or you go to spotify you'll find it uh they, as you said, because I started the podcast at the Athletic, they won't let me bring Standard Groom only over. And I tried and tried and tried because it's a good name and my name and all that. And uh, that's a whole other fight I won't get into. So we had to come up with something else. So I went to my fantasy football team name. That I that's perfect for that. I think it's pretty good for this one too. Last Man Standing. Yes. That's the name of the podcast. So. You can, you'll be able to find that everywhere. Bram showed me it's all on iTunes right now. So here's what you need to do. We're going to run the podcast, the, ep- the episodes, on both feeds now through the preseason. But what you need to do is go to the new feed, Last Man Standing. Again, wherever you do your podcast, it should be there. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. That way, at the end of the preseason, when we stop the, the populating the standard room only pot feed, you won't miss anything out. So tell your friends, tell everybody you know, whether they, the people that you know who listen, friends who been maybe haven't been gotten in yet. That's the deal. Go uh, go over to uh, find Last Man Standing. You'll find it, and uh, that'll be big help to me and to Bram. Yeah, and we'll be I'll be screaming at Ben to tweet this link out constantly so that we hopefully the audience that you have migrates over. And we know it's tricky, but it's literally one minor ask. And the reality is. 
the other feeds going to cease to have content on it within a few weeks so you're going to have to do it and we still need to work out the details in the sense that we haven't gotten this far yet but like we're also because as you know bram uh john kime do youtube eventually we'll get to that eventually we will get to that in fact like even with my show that i moved over and again this is two in the weeds for anybody who cares but like I am not putting every show up there. I'm only doing certain ones that I put up there. And we're going to talk about that with you as well because it's an endeavor. So um, we'll, you know, we'll talk about that as time goes on. All right. So that's the deal. So again, right now, go find it. Standard. Uh, let's see, I'm going to do this a hundred times. Last Man Standing, iTunes, Spotify. Presumably it should be anywhere you do it. And uh, we'll go from there. Excited to move, to move and join Bram. Uh, on this, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun for me to have somebody to bounce ideas off. But it's more fun to do it with somebody. I don't know how I like the, the the solo people out there. Good for them. But I, I, I like a community. It takes yeah. it takes a village to build a podcast. And I'm excited to join. Uh, excited to join this one. Um, all right. So we'll talk about that more. You'll hear me talk about this plenty at the end of this as well. But let's talk a little bit about practice. Yeah. Actually, let's talk about this. Jaden Daniels, we literally just spoke to him five minutes ago. Um I have been very impressed with him talking to us. Now, look, nothing's happened yet. They haven't lost a game. He hasn't thrown an interception. He hasn't been criticized. Nothing's really happened yet. So it's easy to say, well, everything's positive. But the maturity in which he handles us, that talks to us, he, he doesn't come in acting like he's got all the answers, yet simultaneously he's got a quiet confidence. He's pretty calm up there. He's pretty comfortable with us and all that i think that goes a long way to sh- i've always thought how people handle themselves at a press conference goes a l- over time at least goes a long way towards showing what they're like behind the scenes whether you're a coach or a player over and i think he looks like the guy that we keep hearing about that he is one of the guys that he fits in that he's got a leadership vibe to him and i every time we talk to him i've been impressed by that yeah i you know very 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 few cases and we can probably name a few that somebody takes on a persona with the press and is really not like that. Um, That's rare, though. Most people kind of reveal who they are in these settings, whether they're comfortable or uncomfortable with them. And I think he's a pretty humble guy. I think he has worked really hard to get to the place that he got to. um, And apparently he does not feel like he's made it. And that is promising to me. When you're the number two overall pick and you're Heisman Trophy winner and you have the season that he had, and he went from Arizona State to LSU, so upgrade in competition, and he got better and succeeded and got to where he got to, you might have thought that his demeanor or ego would have changed with it. And maybe it has, but I don't get that sense. And I think this is a very, very good attribute that he has. But I agree with you, and I feel like every conversation I have about him or the team in general is I really don't know much. They're not even practicing at full speed. We're two weeks in. I haven't seen them conduct what I would consider a full speed football practice yet. He hasn't been tackled. He hasn't been chased by Micah Parsons. He hasn't thrown an interception. They haven't lost a game where he failed to convert a third and six in the fourth quarter. So until all these things happen and we see how he reacts to all of that, I just don't think we know a ton other than he's an incredible prospect and you can see that day to day to day. Yeah. No, and you're right. I mean, the only inside I have before he got here was at the Senior Bowl talking to some of his uh, former LSU teammates and you know I didn't know much about him the person I just only knew the player and they said a lot of the things that we're seeing now the quiet confidence that he wasn't the rah-rah guy in the locker room but you knew he was the leader so and that's a lot what we're hearing here now too obviously he doesn't need to be the leader today they've got Bobby Wagner John Allen etc but you need to have that you need to have the guys in in the huddle feel that you are there's reason to believe, and I think he's giving them a lot to that. That's just off the field stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about the on the field stuff. Um, you know, I don't want to say like, oh my god, these guys are he's lighting up the practice. Anyway, it was fine today, but he made a throw today that like every day almost, even if the days were like a little quiet or a little muted for the offense, he makes a play or two that you're like, oh yeah, got it. That's why. That's why he's this guy. He threw. He made a pass today. He was about forty yards. Uh, by around the 40 yard line heading to the end zone in the pocket he finds uh jahan uh, found a found a soft spot down deep down the field about the five yard line and like he wasn't the defensive backs weren't really that close but nonetheless there was a guy in front there was a guy in the back and he threw it perfectly to jahan to make the catch and you know you, i'm guaranteed you'll see that on the team's uh, twitter feed 
it, he just makes those types of plays. And again, there'll be up, there'll be bumps in the road for rookies because that's just what happens. But the, you, can, if, if you didn't know anything else, you can see it out here that he's got the accuracy, he's got the goods, the physical tools. He had a really long run today as well. So I think those are the things that I stand out. He'll he'll screw up. But the, it's not a matter of screwing up. It's a matter of what's the ceiling. And I think he's clearly got a pretty good one. Not just saying the obvious, but like watching him out here. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, when you make a high draft pick like this, first impressions really matter. Um, you know, I've, I've read the reports out of New England. Like, it sounds like it's very up and down with Drake May. We've seen this before with high draft picks here. Um, the first impression here is really good. Everything that they said about him, the work ethic, it's carried over here. Uh, his humility, it's carried over here. His athleticism is obvious. So, like, you know, seeing that, it, it, it's not a surprise. But I'm with you. Like, the throw to Jahan today, the second it went out of his hands, you know, I, I went, watch that. Those are the plays that put him in the Pro Bowl. Um, he did one a few days ago that was, you know, again, he knows he's not being tackled. So a pass rush is a faux pass rush. But I think it was Dorrance Armstrong who beat somebody off the edge. And he's just backpedaling, sliding into pressure, and he flicks the ball off his back foot that hits McLaurin 35 yards downfield, literally in stride. And I saw this and I went, if he does that in a game, he's going to the Pro Bowl. So these are these little moments that give me a lot of hope that they got the right guy. And I think more than anything, just broadly, you know, having lived and grown up and just an enormous fan of this team and having covered it for over two decades now, we're just so dying for the guy and I don't want to get over my skis about it, but are, there are these little moments very early in this process where you go, uh, he might be it. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing. I, you know, every time we have these, I have these conversations, I'm sure you do the same. I have to preface, like, okay, it's only practice. Let's all calm down. But at the same point, like, you want to get excited about it. I, I can be the half-class empty guy easily, but I... Around here, it'd be very easy to do. Honestly. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, but but you want to be excited for him, and I want the fans to be excited for him, and you know, if there's flaws, we call them out, but for the most part, you know, from what we can see, he's passing the tests. Obviously, the coaching staff has been pretty pretty happy with what they've seen, so Jets this week, joint practice uh, Thursday, game Saturday, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, he said he'll play. We don't know if he's starting. Do you care if he starts? Like, obviously, this is not where week one. I'm just talking about the, the preseason game. Uh, no, I don't. But, you know, knowing that the offensive line is kind of makeshift right now, I kind of do want him behind the steadiest group yeah. personally. So um, I would think that that would be the plan. But I don't know. And it was interesting. Like this morning when Dan Quinn said, you know, he's going to play, nobody followed up with, is he going to start? I think people just assumed it. And then... He got asked about it and looked back at the – because it was assumed he was going to start the way a question was prefaced to him. And he looked at, like, the PR staff and was like, I didn't hear that. So now we're in mystery mode for probably 24 hours when Dan Quinn's going to probably clear up whether he's starting or not. I don't – no, I don't care, but I'm more inclined to believe if you're going to put him out there, put him out there with the best starting five on the offensive line – um, because I want to see him protected, honestly, early here. That's how I feel about it. 100%. I mean, the, in general, the preseason, coming out healthy is the most important aspect. But obviously, you do have to play, you, especially for the rookie. At some point, you do have to get – you know, if Aaron Rodgers doesn't do anything with the Jets, I get hurt he's not going to play in the preseason. I get it. But at some point, you got to play, and uh, hopefully he's out there. I doubt, Whatever he is, I doubt it's going to be very long because that's typically how that works. The other thing that really kind of has struck me during all of this – is I don't feel like, I referenced this earlier, I don't know if you feel the same way, I haven't seen them go really full speed, football speed, really yet. And I keep waiting for that to happen. Is the first time that's going to happen is in a preseason game? Like, that's where we're trending toward because we're running out of time to do it. And if they don't do literal 11 on 11 versus the Jets in the joint practice, and I don't know what the schedule is there, then that's what's going to happen. And that that's the one thing that's happened this summer so far that feels a touch unusual to me, and maybe it's just a sign of the times that a lot of teams just don't do it, and some of it's been collectively bargained out of the first week of training camp, but I thought for sure by now we'd hear some popping, and we have not. Like, they have taken protecting everybody to an extreme this year, and maybe it's a trend and maybe it's not, but I can't believe we're heading to a preseason game, and I don't think they've hit each other yet. Well, I think the last couple of practices, it was feeling like it was getting a little chippy. It was like a little, like... Chippy. 
Yeah, well, I mean, but, but, but in order for it to be chippy, you have to be aggressive. So, you know. Yeah, well, I felt like when I saw the chippiness and went, when's the lid coming off? Right. Like, when do, when do you unleash it? Right. Because it's unnatural for these guys not to hit each other. And after right. a while, they kind of have to. So I've been a little surprised. And, you know, listen, if they get to your point, if they get to the regular season and they're healthy, well, that's the most important thing. But I do think, you know, that to play football, you got to practice it. And I'm just a touch surprised. It's a mild surprise. It's not a. It's not a really like a criticism. It's just I'm surprised that here we are. Because Dan Quinn talks openly about you're gonna like the way we play. We're gonna make you proud. We're coming with intensity. We're gonna bring it. Keep saying things like that. I haven't seen that yet. Right. I haven't seen the evidence of that yet. But it's also because he's not letting them. They're reined in. And I'm like, when are they going to let him loose? When's the lid come off? It, it, it is such bizarre, right? You watch baseball spring training. It's the same game, other than, like, the pitcher maybe only throws two, three innings and then the starters. But it's they're playing baseball. Basketball, to some degree, the same. Here, the biggest element of the game, the physicality, is not happening. And oh. uh, it is, you know, even just putting on the pads. I mean, they've only put on the pads a few days. And some guys haven't put on pads since... December. That's right. So, you know, so it is weird to have to get that in, and yet they're not really kind of doing it. Yeah, I agree. Um, you mentioned surprise. I'm just going to throw this out there, and I'll start so you can think about it. I'm trying to think, like, what's the biggest thing I'm surprised about so far um, in this camp? This is sort of, like, off the beaten path. I was talking about it today on the sidelines, so I thought I'd bring it up. I, they have been doing special teams pretty much every day, which... I'm not saying they didn't before, but there's clearly more of an emphasis because of the new kick return rules yeah. and they're trying to figure it out. And they've had eight to ten guys at most days back there as a returner. I can't believe that we I haven't one day seen Chris Rodriguez back there. Huh. Not one day. I thought he was body type was the perfect guy for this. It makes me think that, and I've talk, written about this, that his job is a lot less safe than I think a lot of people probably assume. Because if he's not going to be returning kicks as the third guy, I, uh, I, I, that, that kind of blows my mind. So I, I am curious to see what happens with the backfield. I don't know if that means they keep a vet like Jeremy McNichols. There's two undrafted free agents, including Austin Jones, who played at USC last year when Kingsbury was there. But anyway, just the, Chris Rodriguez has been very muted. Not that I thought he would be taking reps from Robinson or Eckler, but I don't know. It seemed like he was on the rise, and now it, it's been... Oddly quiet. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really thought about him, but, you know. There you go. See, I haven't really thought about him. Obviously, we know who the top two backs are here. Um, are they going to keep four? Maybe, maybe not. Are they just going to keep three? If they are going to keep three, I would be more inclined to see McNichols make the team, honestly. If they're going to keep four, I would throw him into that. I haven't seen one of these undrafted rookies do anything that, like, makes me feel like, well, they're going to be kept over someone like Rodriguez, but that's what the games are for. Because they're going to get run, so they're going to get an opportunity. I think your theory is going to get really tested on how much playing time he gets against the Jets, because clearly he's got to earn his way, so we'll have to see. I don't necessarily agree with you about kickoff return with him, personally. Um, I'm waiting to see. My, my gut tells me this is a two-cut running back slash skill position guy, that this is what's very different about this. Um, punt returns are the same, in my opinion. It's a one-cut go, make somebody miss, and find some room. Kickoff return used to be similar, where it's a you know, start a straight line attack. Once you get to about the 20, when you meet everybody, it's kind of one cut, find a seam and go. I think people are going to start running plays down there, or at least attempt to run some form of play. And I look at somebody like DeAndre Swift and I go, a two cut quick back, Eckler for that matter, if they get him to do it, they can make a couple of quick cuts because everybody's in enclosed space and not running full speed would be, I'm more inclined to believe that that's going to be a successful returner. I could be proven wrong about that. And that's why I look at him and I go, he's more of a bruiser to me. He's not a two cut back. I think he's a valuable player. And I think he was a good player for them last year, but maybe he doesn't fit in that role. And if, and to your point, if he doesn't fit in that role, does he fit at all? And that, that will be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah. Eckler, again, the preface of practice, but Eckler has looked good in general. He's looked quicker than maybe some people had thought after last year uh you know the struggles that he had with the chargers uh yeah i i just i've just been surprised that they're, they're trying everybody back there they, they tried two guys back there who've been cut since uh and yet rodriguez hasn't been back there i don't know, i just find that odd how about you any uh what, what would say if, if i said what's been the biggest surprise for you uh, in camp well two things then and one is off of the other one like i thought like the, the offensive line i think we all knew there was going to be competition 
the musical chairs part of it has thrown me a little bit. Like, how many people do how many different things on a daily basis? And when it happened last week for just a couple days in a row and that Dan Quinn kind of explained we're doing this on purpose, I went, okay, fine. It's carried over. Like, it's continued. Andrew Wiley has had tightness, but then is missing a lot of time a without any time. real explanation. You know, Brandon Coleman suddenly looks like he might be a starter, or at least they're positioning him that way, which means if he is, does that mean Cornelius Lucas is the starter at right tackle? I don't know. And then, you know, I think Allegretti's the starter at left guard, but they have shifted him around. They seem to have clarified that, like, there's a lot of movement with a lot of guys, and it's a fluid position, and I'm not surprised by that. So at the same time, this is what I expected the corner position to be. Very fluid. Run a lot of different guys out there. That's not been the case. If you watch them, it's Forbes and St. Juice almost exclusively with the ones. Michael Davis gets a run in the rotation and is clearly going to be one of the primary corners for them. But I thought it would be way more Wild West the way the O-line is, and that hasn't played out that way. So... There might be more confidence in St. Juice and Forbes than I thought there was going to be going in. Or maybe, you know, or maybe there's a plan shift at some point, but I'm a touch surprised I haven't seen as much fluidity in that position group. Yeah, I mean, first of all, with, with the line, so Wiley's been out several practices in a row now, or we're done very li- little with his tightness. We'll see what that means. It does feel like Coleman's getting every opportunity right now to uh, be the left tackle. And even to your point of like changing things around, Today, Sam Cosby wasn't out there, uh, so they had uh, who, uh, the, the backup center, uh, Dieter, Dieter, playing a little bit of right guard. Uh, but Coleman had feeling like he could be out there, and then the question is, yeah, what happens at uh, right tackle? Dan Quinn did say, because I asked, uh, is there any chance you could look at Wiley at a guard spot since he played it previously at Kansas City? But he said no. He said no, he said no to that. So, that. so Wiley would be out there or not. To your point of the corners, I totally get it. I mean, it's not like any of the top guys look to be that strong, right? Sandra still kind of stood out. Coin has said as much. But in terms of the outside guys, you know, it feels like it's open. But it does feel like there's, like, the top four. So that's St. Hughes, Mike Davis, Forbes, Sandra still. And then there's the other group. Now, the other group's got some interesting guys. Kai Blue Kelly's had some practices where he's looked pretty good. They, they, they got the kid Anusium from Colorado State, the undrafted free agent. He's out there. Um, Ig Benogany is a former first-round pick and has been playing centrally as a backup to Sandra still, so it's hard not to see him at this point being in line to be corner four, you know, corner five. Yeah. Well, I, by the way, Bram has been working on that name for <laughs> weeks, and he nailed it. This is why he's, this is why he's the voice of the commanders. Um, by the way, Christian Holmes was released today. They, they, they picked up a Taylor Stallworth yeah. uh, defensive tackle. Holmes is out. Similar to how I thought about Dax Milne. He's a name that we knew, but I watched him practice. I was like, I, I don't see how this is going to work. It's probably better for him to get released now. But nonetheless, two seventh-round picks who have been here for a couple of years, uh, been released in a couple of days, and it's I mean, getting more and more of those guys. Yeah, I mean, this is in the weeds, too, but, like, James Pierre's looked okay. This is a veteran. Yeah. You know, they've brought in some veterans, you know, some guys that the names aren't going to, you know, shock you, but if you follow the league, you know that they're viable NFL players. Christian Holmes got a hard time beating, like, if we're naming four and they're going to keep five or six, um, he's going to have a hard time beating out someone like James Pierre. Like, like that guy's got way more of a shot to make the team than Holmes does. And I think they're doing some favors here early by letting some guys yeah. get out into the marketplace. And also, Holmes was, um, he's, he, came, he was an older rookie. Wasn't he, like, 25 when he came in? Yeah, something so, like that. Yeah. He was a seventh-round pick. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a previous regime, and, you know, they brought in a couple of, veteran corners it was gonna be very hard for him to, to beat that out right it, it, whatever the position is we hyper focus on these people because they are here that doesn't and because of that we either over praise or sometimes under praise because we're like to kind of be dismissive so he's a guy that he's here but ultimately he's a guy and uh, best of luck to him see where he goes uh next um all right well, i should probably let you go um by the way Nick Allegretti, have you talked to him yet? No. He's like, a, he seems like uh, he seems like he'd be right up my alley. Yeah. I like good personalities, and he seems he's up my alley he, on that. He, yeah, yeah, he fits into like the group. That, last year, the, the offensive line was a fun group to talk to ap- after practices with Cosme. Uh, Wiley, Nick Gates was a lot of fun to talk to uh, until that went a, a different direction. So he'll fit in with that. Um, I, this is a bad look for me. I'm, I'm, I forgot to mention this at the top, talking here to my new, uh, my new guy. But I, I talked to Nick Allegretti. I'm going to run that. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 
Okay. That was the tease. That was the tease. Yeah, I should have said it earlier. Whatever. Um, all right. So we'll, we'll we'll get to Nick Allegretti in a second. Anything else from you before I let you get back out there from uh, uh, from these practices that stood out? Uh, last thing, and I'll let you weigh in on this just for a moment. Like, I don't think they could have picked a more perfect team to have a joint practice with, because if we're talking about we really want to see what these corners are and we really want to see what our offensive line is. Think about who they're practicing against, because you're not going to get Rodgers in that game, but you're going to get Rodgers, Garrett Williams, Mike Williams, and all that in this practice in one-on-one drills, and the offensive line gets one of, if not the best front in football. This is going to be very telling. I think next week, too, they're going to get Tua, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle. We're going to really see it in a joint practice, but I don't know that the defensive line is going to test uh, the offensive line similarly that this one is, so... This is like last summer, I remember that Ravens joint practice. I went, that's the whole summer to me. Like, what what does that look like? This Jets joint practice is going to be a marker of where two groups that are very much in question here, it's going to be a it's going to be a show me test on Thursday because of who they're going up against, and it really couldn't have worked out better with the competition that they got. No, it's a great point. I mean, assuming that Rodgers is full go in in the joint practice, yeah. I mean, you know, put putting aside the Aaron Rodgersness, he's still that guy. And uh, yeah, right. That's going to be a really good test. And that is, you know, when people ask, like, what do I think they're, the commander's going to be this year? And obviously so much depends on the rookies, Jaden, most notably. The secondary is way up there on this list. On the one hand, I keep thinking they'll improve with the coaching staff, that they'll get the coaching staff has shown they can get a lot out of guys who are developing, whatever. But on the other hand, if you're telling me that St. Just and Mike Davis are your top two corners, Based on what what you know, what we've seen, uh, that's not ideal. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that works. Obviously, we didn't talk about the safeties, but I think Martin Chin that they, they've looked pretty good. But again, uh, a test for them. All right, uh, I'm going to get to Nick Allegretti, but I'm going to let you go first. Bram, always a pleasure, and thanks so much for uh, letting me be part of uh, the Empire uh, family. So again, since Bram's staring at me, give me daggers. Go find. I'll tweet it out. You can uh, so you can find me at Ben Standing, but uh, Last Man Standing is going to be the name of the new podcast. Go subscribe; it'll be on both feeds through the preseason. But eventually, Standing Room only is going away. Last Man Standing will be the last podcast standing in a few weeks. That is interesting and important. Yes, <laughs> I got I got I got podcast flex. I can change my names. Uh, Bram, appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, let's get to it. Here is my conversation with, uh, I mean, likely starting left guard Nick Allegretti, who, of course, was with the Kansas City Chiefs. I uh, really enjoyed this one. Here we go. Uh, some thoughts on training camp from a new member of the Commander's Offensive Line. All right, we're talking right after practice with uh, Nick Allegretti. Uh, I, I've always feel bad talking to you guys right after practice because you guys are it's, – it's not it's a cool day today at least. It wasn't too bad, but how, how does it uh, – say it was a longer practice, though. How did it kind of feel today? It's a good day. First day that we really put a, a high-volume uh, reps out there. Uh, maybe the second day, but it was a good day. A uh, lot of good work, a lot of back and forth O&D. Um, just love the way that we're competing day in, day out. It's a really – Really cool way that DQ sets up practice. That everything's a competition. There's very few, you know, line up and just run ten third downs in a row. It's it's all cohesive. feels feels like a game a lot, which is awesome. Well, what's an example from the offensive line perspective that maybe is different than what you had before? Uh, you know, so we do like a, a first, second, third down. So it feels more of a, a drive. Um, whereas you know, first down the D line doesn't know if it's going to be a run or a pass. Second down, depending on the down and distance. You know, they might not know again. So it's it feels more game like rather than a set where it's you know four straight third and long. It's like they just got their ears pinned back. And in a game that happens, third and long, you know, but rarely are you just going to get third and long, third and long. You know, so it's uh, a little bit more of a game feel. I really like the way that we uh, draw it up, mix the running pass in there, uh, and even shoot no no shoulder pads. Is able to repeat it. It's, it's a really good tempo. Um, I feel like it is a challenge of finding teams that can compete and practice at a high level and a high speed without pads on. Um, 
you know, keep your bodies fresher. I think we do a really good job of that. Uh, I say this at the risk of knowing you're in arm's length and could take me out if you want, but you know, it feels like the offense has been a little bit slow so far in the last first few years, right? at least in the, the things that we can see that plays down the field. There hasn't been as many. Today, there was definitely a lot more. Felt the offense was from Jaden and all down. Did you did, did something, did it feel different today from where you can see in the trenches? You know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that I felt anything because for me, it's the result downfield's awesome. Um, right. That, that's a good problem. I'm worried. Right now, I'm just worried about that box. Figuring out how we're going to block that seven man, eight man box. How I'm playing next to Tyler and uh, Brandon and Lucas, whoever's out there, and just trying to figure out ourselves. So, yeah. potentially could have been a little bit of a longer day, uh, but I, I couldn't say I, I feel anything personally from that. Yeah. But. Fair, fair, fair enough. But today you were, so uh, they've been obviously mixing and matching you guys mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, I, I don't even know. People ask me who's on the first team. I'm like, well, it's hard to say because everybody's kind of playing everywhere. But today yeah. you were out, out there with Tyler and the, the, the quote unquote sort of first yeah. group. Um, how is that chemistry building? And, and when you're mixing and matching, does that make it more challenging? Or is it just, hey, I, I may have to play with somebody else down the line? Let's, let's see what happens. You know, yeah, it's, you, if, if the opportunity was there for us to have a day one starting five, you build a better chemistry that way. However, I mean, you know, take a look in the last 10 years. Find an O line. Very few O lines go week one to week 18 with the same five. So the fact that we are mixing and matching will help us throughout the year. You know, myself, uh, Dieter, CP, all these guys that are, we're getting the reps of right, left, center, um, the tackle switch and all. Like it's going to help us to, to give us that opportunity because someone's, you know, going to roll an ankle, be out for a week. And some, the next guy has to be able to step in has to be a smooth transition because if there's a drop off there it's, it's a clear weak point in the office it has to be next man up roll through a week or two guys healthy back in so I, I think this will help us and with the new very new room new coaches and everything working with different guys helps the coaches see different techniques and we really get to understand what they want out of us when you mix and match i don't know how easy you can answer this but like obviously the offensive line last year there were some questions sacks all things like that and that's why they brought in you and tyler and, and drafted brandon mm -hmm. coleman can you get a feel for right now where you guys are relative to hey if you had to go out there or is it still sort of the work in progress because like you said so much is is new you know what I, I love the offensive line group that we have tough guys that love competing and at the end of the day that if you have that guys that want to compete every single day that are going to bust their ass for 60 minutes on Sundays, you're going to be in a good spot. This league is it's hard as hell. It's hard to win a single football game. Um, you know, so if you have a team that's going to buy into the five guys we have up front, the 11 guys we have on offense, and the 53 men that, you know, that we have every Sunday, that's hugely important, and I think we, we have that right now. It, it goes without saying you when you're going up against John Allen and Deron Payne or however, that, that that's a good good work for you. Is that I – mean, do you uh, uh, concur with that? What a, I mean, awesome opportunity every day. <laughs> Say awesome with a little bit of like, you know, I, I don't mind not having to block them every once in a while, but it is awesome getting to compete against guys like that. that not only are they high-level players, but they've been playing with each other so well. So like, the way that they run games, it's it's so in sync, and it's the way the teams start to run games week 8, 9, 10, and through the rest of the season they're running at day one because they play together forever. Um, and then, yeah, you just get to work. You know that every single day you're going to go out there, you're going to compete, you're going to win some reps, you're going to lose some reps, and you get to learn from them. I mean, it is awesome getting to play with those guys. And then the fact that I mean, they may – they're close to the hardest two working guys on the defense. Right. That skill level with that work ethic is very rare, so it's, a, it's really – it's fun for me, even though I say the word fun with a little sick, <laughs> sick yeah. mentality, but it, it is really fun getting to see guys that have had so much individual success busting their butt every day. Right. Well, you know, the whole, like, iron sharpens iron thing. Absolutely. Like, we, we all say that sometimes, but this is legitimately you know, what it is you're dealing with. Um, last sort of uh, footballish question. Uh, Brandon Coleman, a lot of interest in what he's been doing. He's been out there, again, with the so-called ones the last few practices. How have you kind of seen him uh, develop? Very, uh, very professional from day one. Um, a lot of rookies come into the league, especially with the NIL. Uh, they have, there's a little bit of an entitlement at times. He has got none of that. Very professional. Um, just kind of goes about his business. He's able to ask questions intelligently and get his questions answered. Um, and then just competes, works, which is all you can ask for. I mean, he, he's out there competing every day against 
definitely Dante Fowler, Armstrong. I mean, we've got some great defense players. You know you're not going to win every single rep, but all you can do is go out, repeat that rep, win or lose, you go to the next. Win or lose, you go to the next, and he's, he's done a great job with that. How's uh, Lansdowne life been? You guys are all together uh, over here. How's that been going? Um, I've been in a dorm the last five years, so Lansdowne is paradise right now. I, I'm sleeping on a king bed rather than uh, two twin beds in a dorm room. So, I mean, it's, I'll stay at the Lansdowne all year if they made us. Well, I know like Andy is one of the few coaches who does want the team to go away. From the outside, I always think that's a good thing, but maybe this is a good hybrid. You're here, but you're at least away from, the, from there, your day-to-day uh, life. There is, a, there is a nice benefit of being away from home because there are distractions. I hate saying that because I love my family. It has been tough being away from them. They're coming out here today, so I can't wait to see them. But it is nice to be able to show to work, go home, recover at the hotel, whatever you have to do, go to sleep, wake up. You get a couple weeks to just do football. And then we'll roll out of that into the preseason. We'll get to be home with our families more in the season starts. Um, but we really... Oh, that's adorable. Sorry, um, Zach and his Zach and his little buddy. But um, yeah, we, we get a chance to just focus on football, and I, so I truly do enjoy. I think it's a good happy medium. You know, Brad, I don't want to go back to the dorm ever again if I can prevent that. But uh, it's a good happy medium. Uh, and just lastly, I don't know. In whatever downtime you have, the Olympics are going on right now. Have you been able to catch any of that? Uh, I've watched a little bit of it. Uh, I will probably watch every single wrestling match that I am able to watch as soon as that starts in a few days got a great great team uh lined up we also have a bunch of american wrestlers wrestling for other countries as well that i wrestled with growing up so uh i'll watch as much wrestling as i can really excited for uh, a couple guys up from michigan the two heavyweights wrestling freestyle greco uh but it's loaded with big 10 guys i mean we got a shot to go out there and reel in some gold medal so i'm fired up oh so you're like a wrestling insider you like know this guy who's like the guy to watch if we're if people are casual and kind of watching wrestling I mean, I'll just name the free. You got Spencer Lee, uh, you got Zane Rutherford, you got Kyle Dake. Uh, Did you go up against any of them, or I don't know what weight no, class No, uh, so at 57, Spencer Lee's our guy. I wrestled with Stefan Micic, who actually is a returning gold medalist from Serbia, but he's from yeah. Indiana. Okay. But he wrestles for Serbia. Sure. Um, and Adam Kuhn and uh, Mason Paris, the, the, the Greco and the freestyle heavyweights, they're, uh, they're college coaches, actually, my kids' kids' club coach, Sean Burmett. So I have a real good relationship with him. and. Wrestling, there are two great sports in the world. There's a lot of them, but football is the best team sport. Wrestling is the best individual sport. Love that sport. It's a, it helped me get to where I am. So uh, I watch every everything I can. The, one of my, fa- I love the Olympics. I, I, I just don't have as much time doing this, but yeah. like one of my favorite moments was the Rulon Gardner oh, yeah. uh, beating Karelin. I mean, that that is like, you can tell me if I'm wrong. That feels like it's a, the Buster Douglas to Tyson, or maybe even crazier because that guy was yeah. such a legend. It, yeah, I got the chills when you mentioned it because yeah, I mean. What was he? Three or four time gold medals. He never, he never lost. You couldn't beat him. The United States is not a Greco country as well, and he goes out there and wins a Greco gold medal. Uh, the rule on really was kind of, kind of the earliest uh, Olympic memory that I have, and then obviously got to watch Jordan, Jordan Burroughs for years out of Nebraska. Uh, one of the best international wrestlers ever. Um, probably the best U.S. wrestler ever. Um, you get me on wrestling. I mean, this podcast will be three <laughs> hours now because I, I, I absolutely love it. It's, a, it's the biggest fan sport that I have uh, with football being a profession. I absolutely love it. Me and my brother go to the NCAAs every year. That is our – we we nerd out over wrestling. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, when, I'll catch it and we'll, we'll come back. We'll circle back. We'll get the analysis. Maybe if, when somebody's in a gold medal match and uh, get the get the people prepared. Absolutely. Uh, I didn't mention Aaron Brooks and Kyle Snyder, those are the other two freestyle guys. I don't want to miss the lineup. It's yeah. Like, we got a star-studded six guys out there at the men's freestyle. Also have some great women wrestlers as well. I like it. Nick, I really appreciate the time. Good luck the rest of training camp, and we'll talk soon. Appreciate you, man. Thanks. Thank you. Great time. I really uh, enjoyed that conversation, as I said. Got a in, got in, uh, chance to talk a little bit about the Olympics. I don't really pay much attention to wrestling, but um, he clearly does. Uh, so that was enjoyable. And I think, look, the, the three guys in the middle, Biotic at center, Cosme at right guard, Allegretti at the at the uh, left guard. That's gonna likely be the strength of this offensive line, unless you know Brandon Coleman emerges as not just the starting left tackle, but a pretty good one. So obviously having those guys healthy and uh, 
clicking is going to be a big deal for this team. Uh, speaking of the offensive line, it's not going to surprise me if Washington adds another offensive tackle or two this week, at least before the Jets game, if not maybe even before the joint practice. They've definitely been a bit thin because of Wiley missing a bunch of practices. They also had an injury today, well, a, a, an apparent injury today. Alex Akinbulu, who's been around here the last couple of years, practice squad uh, and such, he went down during team drills, had to be helped off the field. No, no word on what is happening there. But between his absence, Wiley, Sam Cosme was out today with what I was told was just a uh, an illness. Not, it doesn't sound like it's a big deal. They had to use Mason Brooks at right tackle. I, I, Mason Brooks is a guy who last year I thought looked pretty interesting in training camp at guard. Uh, at guard, right? So the um, that's not expect. He's not really supposed to be playing tackle. By the way, Braden Daniels was available, and they didn't use him there. He's been mainly playing guard in practice, and you know it doesn't look like his chances are super great of making the team. But that's a whole other story. In any event, I won't be surprised if they add some more help. Uh, you know, we focus a lot on, on Jaden Daniels and otherwise they're, they're going to have a real test. The offensive line going up against the Jets, Quinn and Williams, of course, one of the best defensive tackles in the league. They've got Sauce Gardner at cornerback. So, uh, you know, I I'm, don't know for sure who the Jets are playing, if they're going to sit any of their vets, etc. But if they're out there, that's going to be a big challenge for this group. All right. Uh, big thanks to Bram Weinstein, of course, with Empire Media. Uh, big thanks to Nick Allegretti as well. And of course, everyone here for checking out the podcast. And once again, just as I'm going to have to I'm gonna keep saying it for a little bit now, please go check out on iTunes or Spotify again, or wherever you want to do your podcasting. I'm a Podbean guy myself on my uh, phone. Uh, go look for Last Man Standing. That's going to be the name of the new podcast with Bram at Empire Media. We will close the, or we will stop uploading uh, episodes to Standard Room only after the preseason games. So, you know, it'll be there for a couple more weeks, but click subscribe to the new one. Do it now. It'll make everybody feel a lot better over here. And that way you also won't miss any of the podcast as we move forward towards the season. Uh, but that is it for now. Until next time. See ya.